What is going to be the chronology of end time events? Will the rapture occur before the tribulation begins, or will it be during the tribulation, or perhaps at the end of it? And if it is before the tribulation, then does it trigger the tribulation, or will there be events between the rapture and the tribulation? And where does the war of Gog and Magog fit into all these end time events? For a fascinating discussion of these and other questions about chronology, stay tuned for an interview with Ron Rhodes, who is a prolific Bible prophecy author. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I am delighted to have as our special guest this week, Dr. Ron Rhodes, who is a prolific writer and a very good one. He writes about many spiritual topics, including Bible prophecy. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy for what, the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth time. It's well, a lot. A I've lot stopped time. counting, but it's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's always a joy to have you. It is, sir. Always good to have you on. Thank you, Nathan. And I also want to introduce to you our web minister and co-host of this pro program, also an associate uh, uh, evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries, and that's Nathan Jones. Nathan, how about you kicking off this uh, program by introducing our guest? Well, I'd be honored to. I'd be honored to. Folks, if you're regular viewers of our program, then you're already familiar with Dr. Ron Rhodes, because he's been our guest on this program, as Dr. Reagan said, several times. He's the founder and director of a ministry called Reasoning from the Scriptures. His ministry is located in Frisco, Texas, and it specializes in defending Christianity against atheists, agnostics, skeptics, the cults, world religions, and any group that teaches false doctrine. He's also an expert in the field of Bible prophecy, and he's written many, many books about what the Bible has to say about the end times, including this particular one, The End Times in Chronological Order. You know, Ron, I found out something interesting about you recently. In fact, I found out a lot of things interesting <laughs> about you, but one in particular, and that is that your publisher, Harvest House, recently awarded you the Harvest Gold Award for selling over one million books. In one fact, we million. have a photo oh. of you receiving that award from the president of Harvest House, Bob Hawkins. Congratulations to oh, you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm humbled to have received that award. And, and a million copies. And how many books have you written now? Uh, it's over 70. I stopped counting, but uh, <laughs> I, I really love what I'm doing. In fact, uh, it's so wonderful to be able to serve the Lord in this capacity. Yes. Well, we uh, love your books, and uh, this one in particular, The End Times in Chronological Order. I wanted to introduce it to our viewers because uh, this is one of the most uh, complex aspects of Bible prophecy. Yes. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, okay, folks, now here's what's going to happen in the end times. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It just uh, doesn't do that. You almost have to be a sleuth. It's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And you got to get the Old Testament involved, which most Christians don't know, in order to understand the new and understand this chronology. Talk to us in general about chronology. Well, let me just give you an example okay. to show you what the problem is. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about the earthly body, which is compared to a tent, and then we read about the resurrection body, which is compared to a building. Yes. Now, the text says that when our tent gets knocked down in death, we receive a building from God, a brand new resurrection body. So, some people conclude from that that, well, as soon as you die, you get your resurrection body immediately. But then, wait a minute. Other scholars look at verses like 2 Corinthians 5.8, which says that to be apart from the body is to be at home with the mm -hmm. Lord. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, verses 21 to 23, where Paul expressed his desire to depart and be with Christ in heaven. And they say, well, you know, it seems like we have a, a period where we're disembodied spirits before we get our resurrection bodies. Now, this illustrates what you're talking about. You have a couple of different passages. And what you have to do, Dave, is to consult all the verses that deal with the topic compare them with each other, and make sure they don't contradict. Now, here's why it's important not to contradict. All Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of truth does not contradict Himself. And so, therefore, your best option is to compare all the verses on all the topics and come up with a cohesive viewpoint. But that that's so much work. It is. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and particularly, you have to also get into the Old Testament, which most Christians simply ignore. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, the Bible is about one-fourth Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that it's something you can't ignore. If, if Bible prophecy was 1% of the Bible, it would still be important. Mm -hmm. But if it's over 25% of the Bible was prophetic at the time it was written, that means that God wants us to understand things. And you might remember in the New Testament, Jesus chastised the Jewish leaders for not understanding the signs of the times. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Jesus would say that to some Christians yeah. today, yeah. if you were speaking to us. Well, let me give you an example of the problem of chronology. Sure. Uh, I grew up in a denomination that was amillennial. We hardly ever heard any preaching about Bible prophecy. And uh, when we did, it was mainly the, the, the sermon that says, there is not one verse in the Bible that even implies that Jesus will ever put his feet on this earth again. I heard that a hundred times when I was a kid. And one of the verses that they used for this was 2 Peter chapter 3 and there in verse 10 which says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. They said, see there, the day of the Lord, that's when Jesus comes back. He comes back. When He comes back the earth is consumed with fire. It doesn't say anything about an earthly rain. Well, that's a good verse to use for that position, <laughs> but I think it's easily explainable. You see, the term day of the Lord has, is sometimes misconstrued uh, to, to basically refer only to the tribulation right. period. Or to the day the Lord's going to return. Sometimes well, it's that's used right. that way. It could be used that way. But you know, um, some of my old uh, mentors like uh, Charles Ryrie, who I believe has mm -hmm. been on your program, and Dwight Pentecost, mm -hmm. helped me to understand that it also extends through the Millennial Kingdom. And so when you're referring to the day of the Lord, it begins with the tribulation, but it extends all the way through the millennial kingdom. And then there's a new heavens and a new earth. Now that makes perfect sense from the perspective of Revelation 20 and 21, because in Revelation 20 it talks about the millennial kingdom. And then in Revelation 21 it starts out by saying, then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. And you got to watch out for those thens. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Those thens are chronological well, the, clues. Uh, using this verse, though, uh, to, to prove that there's not going to be a millennium is a classic example of saying you ignore everything else the Bible well, has to Well, that's right. It, it illustrates what I said earlier. That is, that Scripture interprets Scripture. Yes. You have to consult all the verses which deal with this. And there's a lot of other verses that talk about the fact that not only will Christ rule in Jerusalem, you know, this is a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, 2 yes. Samuel 7, yes. and there will be specific land promises that mm -hmm. will be fulfilled for Israel. That's the uh, uh, Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. And the fact is, is that uh, Christ will come again physically to this earth. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. He will judge the nations according to Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and He will set up His millennial kingdom on this earth. And here's something to think about, Dave. All the Old Testament prophecies that point forward to the first coming were fulfilled literally. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, mm -hmm. yes. the, uh, the fact that Christ was going to be a virgin born, Isaiah 7 14, pierced for our sins, Zechariah 12 yes. 10, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5 2. <laughs> all the prophecies dealing with the second coming and beyond will also be fulfilled literally. Well, that's uh, another thing. When I was growing up, they told me, well, you got to understand that all Bible prophecy is apocalyptic. I thought that was a a, uh, an illness or something, a disease, <laughs> but it was apocalyptic and it never means what it says. No. Well, I would disagree with that. There are symbols, for example, in the book of Revelation, but right there in the context of Revelation, most of those symbols get defined for yes. us. For, for example, you do see a reference to seven lampstands, but then the text tells, tells us you. those seven lampstands right. represent seven churches. Right. Or you might read about a bowl of incense, and then the text tells us, this bowl of incense represents the prayers of the saints coming up before God. And so, yes, there are symbols, but the symbols are defined for us, and all of those symbols represent literal truth. Well, my turn around with Bible prophecy occurred with the book of Zechariah, because uh, I discovered when I was 12 years old, I discovered Zechariah 14, and I, I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. I took it to my pastor, and I said, you say that Jesus never put His feet on the earth again. This, this chapter says He's coming to the Mount of Olives. When His foot touches the Mount of Olives, it will split in half. And he sat there and he read it and he read it and he read it. I don't think he'd ever read it before. And finally he looked up and he put his finger in my face and he said, Son, I'm going to tell you something. 
I don't know what this means, but I guarantee you one thing: it doesn't mean what it says. <laughs> you know, and, and and in fact, I was in a public discussion before two thousand people one time in Cincinnati, where the fellow took the position he was a millennialist, and all I used was Zechariah fourteen because I knew they they were focused on Revelation sure, twenty, sure. and he got up and he made this comment. He said, "I don't know what Zechariah means. I have no idea." But I'll guarantee you one thing, it has been fulfilled sometime, somewhere in history because all Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled. Amen. Well, Ron, wow. I want to get into a real <laughs> deep subject here. A lot of debate is the timing of the rapture. So after the break, yeah. let's ask you okay. about that. Sounds good. Folks, we're going to take a brief break and when we come back, we're going to start bombarding Ron with more tough questions. Particularly, I want to know about the timing of the rapture. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Dr. Ron Rhodes. Nathan, why don't you kick off this segment? Well, I want to get back into the rapture. Does it happen before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation? Well, I think it happens before. Before. And, and I base that on the Bible. Did you know that in Revelation 2 and 3, we read about the church 19 times? And then in the discussion on the tribulation in chapters 4 through 18, you don't see the church a single time. It is gone. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, we are told that the church is to be delivered from the wrath to come. That word delivered literally means snatched, snatched away from. We are to be snatched away from the wrath to come, which is a reference to the tribulation period. Because some people say that just means hell wrath, but you're saying well, wrath could also no, be tribulation. No, it's got a definite article in front of it. Now okay. in English the definite article doesn't mean that much, but in the original Greek it does. Okay. Anybody that has doubts about that should read Daniel Wallace's Greek grammar. Lots of good information on the definite <laughs> article there. I'll pass. I think I'll pass. Yeah. Yeah, you can pass. I won't get Greek on you, but the fact is, is that the definite article is defining a specific period of wrath mm -hmm. okay. that is yet to come. And so the church is going to be snatched out of that. And that's in keeping with uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 9, which says that the church is not appointed to wrath, but to salvation in Jesus Christ. But what about the fact that all through the uh, passages about the tribulation, there's reference to saints? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think that Christians, the, part, the, the bride of Christ, the church, will be raptured before the tribulation, but there's going to be many people who become believers during the tribulation. And I think that's the result of several things. You've got the 144,000 Jewish wit witnesses mm -hmm. of Revelation 7 and 14, and they'll be taking the gospel planet wide. You've got the two prophetic witnesses of Revelation 11 who will have the same powers as Moses and Elijah, mm -hmm. and many believe that it will be Moses mm -hmm. and Elijah, mm -hmm. and many will believe because of that. And certainly the Holy Spirit will still be at work uh, bringing about regeneration among people. And then uh, finally, there's still going to be a lot of books left behind and, and Dave Reagan television shows well, left behind. Yeah. And I'm telling yeah. everybody to put in the <laughs> front of their Bible the plan of salvation because these people are not going to have time to read the whole thing. Well, that's yeah. right. And so there's going to be a tremendous harvest according to Plus, Revelation. there's going to be a gospel angel at the end that's going to circumnavigate the globe. That's right. But you know, Revelation 7 says, says there's going to be a great multitude of believers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that become believers during that time. But where, also, do you, where do you fit in the world Gog and Magog and all these end time events? Because the Bible does not say specifically when that's going to occur. Well, I, uh, I believe that's going to happen in the end times, number one. And I say that because in, in Ezekiel 36 through 39, it says that it's going to take place in the last days and the latter years. Right. That always points to the end times. And then the scriptures do give us some chronological clues. For example, the text says specifically that first Israel must become born again as a nation. And then Ezekiel says, Jewish people from all over the world, from all the countries of the world, must flow back to the Holy Land. We've been seeing that every mm -hmm. decade since mm -hmm. Israel became a nation again. And then there's going to be a coalition of nations that arise against Israel, including Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, and the nations it's around the Black right. Sudan. Yeah, right out of the That's exactly right. In fact, Russia now has an alliance with Iran. It has an alliance with Libya. Now, Turkey has been with NATO, but recently, this year, uh, Turkey's been moving away from no mm -hmm. NATO and buddying up with right. Putin over in Russia. Right. And so we see the stage being set for all of us. Well, this. it's clear that it's going to be in the end times. But when I say that the, the timing is not given, I'm talking about the precise timing. Right. Is it going to be before the tribulation, at the beginning, in the middle? When's it going to happen? Well, here's a chronological problem, and I'm going to try to explain it real clear. 
it hinges on when Israel is in a state of peace and security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say that that peace and security comes from the covenant that the Antichrist signs with Israel, yes. which starts the tribulation. That's been sort of the period. historical position. Yeah. That's right. Now, there's another position that a lot of people hold to, and I think it's got good credence to it, that Israel's state of security could be due to its own military and its, its uh, air force. And if that was the case, then this invasion wouldn't have to wait until the that's tribulation right, begins, right, right. but could actually take place in a number of years before the tribulation. But in, it's real clear that it's the end times, though. Well, in fact, you have written a very outstanding book about this called uh, uh, North, North Storm, Storm Rising, Rising. and Love I that. highly recommend it to people. It's all about the Gog, Magog, and All May. about the Gog, Magog, and, and, and I If I remember right, you concluded that most likely it might occur three and a half years before the tribulation begins. Well, you know, it, it really does open up some uh, um, convenience, if I might put it that way, because if God destroys the Muslim invaders prior mm -hmm. to the tribulation, Number one, it makes it much easier for the Antichrist to sign a covenant protecting Israel. Number two, it makes it much easier for Israel to rebuild its temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now there's too much Muslim resistance, yes. but if the Muslim invaders are taken out, that would make it easier. Third, it would make it much easier for the false religion to emerge in the end times because the two primary people groups that would stand against yes. that false religion are now removed. Christians are removed at the rapture. Muslims are taken out at the Ezekiel. It invasion. also solves another problem, and that is that it says that the uh, Israelis are going to spend what seven years cleaning up the battlefield. That's exactly right. And they're not right. going to be there after the middle of. Well, the they're going to be burning weapons and yes. uh, for seven years. And here's the problem: How is it possible that Israel could burn the weapons for seven years if it starts at the beginning of the tribulation? Because right in the middle of the yep. tribulation, the Antichrist claims to be God. And he sets up his headquarters there and he even sits in the temple there. And Jesus says, when that happens, don't even pack your bags. Get out of town. Run for your lives. Now that seems to indicate they're not going to have time to grab all those weapons. And so that would seem to indicate that they start burning those weapons prior to the yes. tribulation. Well, let me raise another question of chronology with you. It has to do with our friend Bill Solis, who uh, is a Bible prophecy writer sure, also. Sure. And he has come out with a new book, just come out, in which he is taking a unique position. He's ta talking, the book focuses on, on the period between the rapture and uh, the uh, beginning of the tribulation. And the first point he makes is that the rapture does not start the tribulation, which I think we would agree with. Sure. Uh, but there's going to be a period of time, and he says that period of time is going to be several years. And he says there's just not enough time in the seven year tribulation for all that the Bible describes. So he takes the seal judgments out and puts them into this period of time, this gap between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. What are the problems with that? Well, the big problem that I have with that is that the three sets of judgment and tribulation seem to belong together mm -hmm. and they're cohesive. You've got the seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and bowl judgments. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. In the Old Testament, this day of tribulation is typically called the day of the wrath of the Lord. Mm -hmm. For example, Zephaniah chapter 1, the day of the wrath of the Lord. So that defines it as a, as a specific period during which God's wrath is poured out. Now, wait a minute. We know that the seal judgments are an outpouring of God's wrath. We know that because, because it's the Lamb of God, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, who opens it, each seal that leads to the unleashing of a new judgment. So that's the wrath of God. You know, there's you know, 1.8 billion people that die during one that's of those right, judgments. Right. How can you possibly say that that is not part of the tribulation? And then furthermore, I think all those judgments can take place rather quickly. Mm -hmm. You've got the emergence of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. seal number one, and then number two, war breaks out, mm -hmm. and then famine breaks out, mm -hmm. which is a natural result of war, and then death occurs on a planetary uh, basis, yes. and then you've got many, many martyrs and cosmic signs, you know, the, uh, the sun turning dark, mm -hmm. the moon turning dark, and stuff like that. There is no reason to say that that cannot take place in the first half of the tribulation period. Well, I think it can. I think that the uh, Antichrist is going to launch a war to take over the whole world. And it seems to me like that this war that he starts morphs into a nuclear war. And yeah. it, it, mm -hmm. One third of the earth being burned. And all well, that. you know, to me, I, I look at uh, conventional wars like World War I, which had about 15 yeah. million people yeah. die, World War II, closer to 60 million. Yes. And that's by conventional war. Yeah. You know, it's hard to kill 1.8 billion yeah, people yeah, by true. conventional war. And it seems to be like there may be uh, weapons of mass destruction. Let me tell you another problem I have with this idea, and that is that uh, it really violates the integrity of Daniel's 70th week. I mean, yeah. the Lord says, I'm going to accomplish certain things among the Jewish people in a period of 70 weeks of years. We got one last 
seven years to go. Right. And when you start moving those out, those are supposed to be a part of that last seven years. Well, that's right. And I might mention to you that just in terms of chronology, that seven-year period spoken of in uh, uh, Daniel 9, 27, mm -hmm. you ought to compare that with Revelation 11 and 12 because the seven-year period is confirmed there because we have several references to half of the tribulation. Yes. Three and a half years mm -hmm. each. There's a reference to 42 months. There's a reference to, uh, you know, uh, 1160 days. Yes. There's the reference to times, time, and half a time. Yes. Times is two years, a time is one year, and half a time is half a year. And those various references to either the first or the second half of the tribulation confirm the seven year period during which all of this unfolds. And from my perspective, when, uh, when John is recording the book of Revelation, and he says right there in chapter four, verse one, he says, after this, Keep in mind that in Revelation 1.19, the Lord had given John an outline of the book of Revelation. Yes. And he indicated that uh, starting in chapter 4, that's going to be prophetic in nature, and all of this stuff is to follow in close concert with each other. Yeah. And so to me, it, it just makes great sense to see the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments as cohesive. They get worse as time goes on, but they all belong together as an unfolding of, of God's wrath on Do earth. Do you see them separate though? You know, some people will say, well, the seal judgments, uh, the trumpet judgments are just an echo of the seal and the bowls are just an echo of the trumpets. Do you see them as 21 distinct judgments or do you see them as just a reiteration of each set? I don't think it's a reiteration. I think okay. you've got three sets of distinct judgments and there's several reasons why <clears throat> I say that. Uh, first of all, if they were the same judgments in each case, you would expect them to be absolutely similar. Yeah, now, there yeah. are some similarities between the uh, trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, but not the seal judgments. And even the, the similarities between the bowls and the trumpet judgments are not similar enough to say that they're the same. Furthermore, in Revelation 15, verse 1, we are told that the bowl judgments represent the last of God's judgments on earth. And with these judgments, the bowl judgments, God's wrath is finished. Okay. Now, that's very clearly indicating that the bowl judgments are distinct from the trumpet judgments right. and the seal judgments. Plus, it says the seal judgments are going to affect one-fourth and the trumpet judgments one-third. and it, it, They're not that's even right. affecting the same number of people. That's exactly right. And the way that it actually works out in Scripture is you get the first six judgments mm -hmm. of the seal judgments, and then the seventh seal judgment represents the seven trumpet judgments. And then as the first six trumpet judgments unfold, the seventh trumpet represents the seven bowls. So they naturally lead, lead into each other with the judgments becoming worse with each passing year. What motivated you to write this book on chronology? Well, it's my opinion that a lot of Christians don't pay too much attention to chronological clues <laughs> no. in the biblical text of Scripture. That's why there's so much confusion on it. And it's my opinion that one of the reasons why the early church was excited about, the, about their Christianity was that they had a strong prophetic hope. Right. But today it seems like there's a lot of prophetic agnosticism with people not sure about anything anymore. I think you can be rather sure about a lot of this. Yes, yes. And so I wrote this book to show people how to watch for those chronological clues that help you to understand the chronology of end time events. Well, I highly recommend the book uh, because I know that many people are confused about chronology. Yeah. And also I know that you are the type of writer who gets it right down uh, to the uh, common person's uh, uh, level. Mm. You, you have a wonderful gift of writing down to earth, well, easy to understand. And um, so I, I think when people read this, they, they'll come out understanding what is the chronological order. You know, uh, I have received so much mail on this book, and yeah. I'm just so thrilled about that, yeah. Dave. There's a lot of church using it for church studies Praise and, God. and Bible yeah. studies and stuff would. like that. Well, look, we've got about two minutes left, and, and I want to end this on a very light note. Uh-oh. One of the things I, I sent a hard question coming. What, what, <laughs> one of the things that I discovered about you is that your family, your entire family, yeah. were the featured singers at Disneyland way long ago. Yeah. Uh, and were on many television programs and all the Rhodes family. I think there were eight of you. Yeah, there were eight of us. We were called the Rhodes kids. Actually, we were kids at the time. You can go to YouTube and type in Rhodes family. Well, you can, and uh, <laughs> you'll see illegal vo videos posted <laughs> online. And, and, and you are you are the teenager at that time. That's right. And uh, we used to do a lot of the big shows like the Tonight Show yeah, and the Merv yeah. Griffin Show and Mike I mean, Douglas. You, and, you all were hot. You were like the Jackson family. Well, we co-headlined in Las Vegas with Ann Margaret, oh, wow. which was a pretty big deal. <laughs> Through that, you came to know the Lord. That's right? exactly right. Well, how, we were, how, tell us that story. We were backstage at uh, uh, at the studio in Burbank, California, where uh, Pat Boone and his family were filming the Glenn Campbell Show. Yes. Studio A, and then 
at Studio B. We were filming the Merv Griffin show, but it had a common green room. So we're back there in this green room and Shirley Boone is talking about her faith in the Lord Jesus. And it's the first time I ever saw anybody cry tears of joy because of relationship with Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this? You know, I grew up in a liberal church and I never heard of a personal relationship with Jesus. And they were very much into Bible prophecy. In yes, fact, they were oh using yes. Hal Lindsey's book, oh The yes. Late Great Planet Earth. And I says, I have never heard of this before. A rapture? What's the rapture? What's the Antichrist? What is all this stuff? Well, long story short, that motivated me to start looking into Bible yeah. prophecy, and I became a believer. How about that? And then one after another, my brothers and, and so sisters became believers. And so many preachers today say Bible prophecy is really irrelevant. Yeah, well, it led me to the Lord. <laughs> so. <laughs> and it did so many people, yes. so many people. Yes. Well, Ron, we appreciate you being on the program so much. Thank you. Really, really. It's always a joy. It. Okay, thank you. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy in our interview with Dr. Ron Rhodes. Ron, can you look in the camera there and tell folks how they can get in contact with you? Well, it's very easy. Just go to ronrhodes.org and you can email me from there. You can download a lot of free stuff. Stop by. Well, Ron, we're going to conclude this program the way we always do, and that is by asking our guest, and I love to have the opportunity to ask you this. Do you believe we're living in the season of the Lord's return? And if so, why? Well, I believe that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. And I, I believe that because of what I call the convergence factor. See, uh, it'd be one thing if it just one prophecy was coming to pass in our day, like Israel being born again. Yeah. You know, that, that's great. It'd be another thing if two prophecies were being fulfilled <laughs> in our day, which, by the way, is happening. But to me, the significant yeah, thing is that we've got multiple prophecies yeah. converging today and pointing to a date in the not too distant future. Just to give you a few examples, we've got the preparations for the Ezekiel invasion taking place right now. There's alliances between Russia and Iran, between Russia and Libya. Uh, there are developing alliances between Russia and Turkey. I mean, these are the very nations that will be involved in this invasion. Uh, scripture indicates that the temple will be rebuilt in the end times. And uh, right now the Sanhedrin has raised the money for it and the architectural plans. I could say so much more, but long story short, we see a lot of prophecies coming to, to pass in our own day. Thank you very much. Folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us again next week, the Lord willing. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Ron Rhodes' book, The End Times in Chronological Order, can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. The book deals with the most difficult aspects of prophetic interpretation, namely, putting all the end time prophetic events in their proper chronological order. There's no place in the Bible where this is done for us. Instead, Bible prophecy students have to piece together the chronological order by using clues that are scattered throughout the scriptures. Dr. Ron Rhodes has done an outstanding job of this. His conclusions, which Dr. Reagan agrees with, are presented in easy to understand language language and all of them are substantiated with scriptural references. In the process, he deals with questions like, will the war of Gog and Magog take place during or before the tribulation? When will the rapture most likely occur, before, during, or after the tribulation? If the rapture occurs before the tribulation, will it mark the beginning of the tribulation? Will there be a gap of time between the two events? Will the tribulation judgments occur sequentially, or do they all occur at the same time? How many resurrections of the saints will there be, and when will they occur? What is going to happen before the gap of time between the second coming and the inauguration of the Lord's 1,000 year reign? To order your copy of this important book, call the number you see on the screen between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday, or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.